Jay Kramer and Edmund White. I had not yet met either one of them. Each existed for me as book and myth. Kramer was a polemicist, a troublemaker, a loudmouth, best known for his satirical novel, Faggots, in which he skewered the self-indulgent culture of 70s gay New York. Edmund White, on the other hand, was the consummate literary author, writer of such refined and beautiful novels as Forgetting Elena and Nocturnes for the King of Naples, as well as the nonfiction books States of Desire, Travels in Gay America, and The Joy of Gay Sex, which he co-wrote with Dr. Charles Silverstein, and through the pages of which I often thumbed furtively when I was a teenager browsing in the bookstores of Palo Alto, California. I still remember some of the pictures. <laughs> uh, Edmund White lived in Paris mysteriously and, I presumed, remotely, while Larry Kramer lived on Lower Fifth Avenue and had his number in the phone book. Both seemed to engender controversy, albeit very different sorts of controversy, wherever they went. White followed the immensely influential novel A Boy's Own Story with Caracol, a fanciful Romana clay that provoked a minor earthquake in literary New York, as well as a breach between him and his one-time champion, Susan Sontag. Meanwhile, Kramer was beca becoming the co-founder of ACT UP, the AIDS Coalition Unleashed Power, irritating the mayor and a lot of rich people with his diatribes and putting on the first and still most famous AIDS play, The Normal Heart. White completed a biography of Jean Genet, as well as the second and third volumes in the trilogy that began with A Boy's Own Story. The Beautiful Room is Empty, and the novel we'll be discussing tonight, The Farewell Symphony. Today, these two men, both of whom I count as friends, continue to embody opposite poles of the gay literary compass. Kramer, the polemicist for whom literature exists above all else to serve political ends, and White, the artist, for whom the idea of literature serving any ends but its own is repugnant. Uh, so it is perhaps no surprise that in a re recent issue of the magazine The Advocate, Larry Kramer attacked White's new novel, The Farewell Symphony, quite viciously, an attack that exemplifies a schism not only between these two men, but between two ways of thinking within gay America. For Kramer, The Fa Farewell Symphony is an immoral book because it describes unapologetically the erotic Petri dish in which, during the 70s, the HIV virus evolved. In other words, it does not serve the proper end, discouraging the Phoenix-like revival of pre-AIDS sex-driven gay culture by painting that culture in the grimmest possible terms. For White, on the other hand, I speak for him, but I believe I can do so fairly, The Farewell Symphony is very simply a novel, and as such, answerable to nothing but itself. As Oscar Wilde once put it, there is no such thing as a moral or an immoral book. Books are well written or badly written. That is all. This is a position which, uh, with which I personally am completely in accord. At the same time, it's hard to throw off Larry Kramer's grief that gay literature has become of late so almost obsessively preoccupied with sexual detail and in particular sexual fantasy, as well as his terror at the abandonment of safe sex practices on the part of young men around the world. In other words, Kramer's is a, Kramer is a his, an hysteric, but his hysteria is hard to ignore. At the same time, he has no ear for subtlety and thus fails to recognize that when Edmund White writes about sex, he does so with wit, humor, and an unerring instinct for the small detail that makes human experience human. I remember with particular vividness a hilarious moment in The Farewell Symphony when one character asks another to shit on him and is disappointed when in lieu of a great big dump, his lover produces what White calls an éclat, a very small one, an étran. Did I get that right? Sex in this scene provides an opportunity for White to describe with sensitivity and real humor the odd pathos that so often accompanies the enactment of a quote-unquote hard erotic fantasy. His is the light touch of the artist, not the sledgehammer blow of the ideologue. To me, finally, the brouhaha over the sexual content of the Farewell Symphony is, at least from a literary standpoint, beside the point. The more significant questions that the novel raises are these. Where does autobiography end and fiction begin? White himself has admitted freely that his work is autobiographical. Why, then, is the Farewell Symphony called a novel? Does everything in a book have to be true for it to be called an autobiography? 
Alternately, does everything in a book have to be false for it to be called a novel? Christopher Isherwood followed his famous Berlin stories with a memoir that purported to give a true account of the episodes on which the stories were based. Yet are we to believe that nothing in Christopher and his kind is embellished or invented? Likewise, the novelist Sybil Bedford retells the story she had already used as the basis for three novels, a legacy, a favorite of the gods, and a compass error in Jigsaw, which she subtitles, curiously enough, a biographical, not autobiographical, novel, and prefaces which the fo with the following note, which seems to me highly relevant tonight. She writes that in the novel, the Kislings and the Aldous Huxleys are the Kislings and the Aldous Huxleys and themselves. The Falkenheims, the Nairns, the Desmirais are not Falkenheims, Nairns, or Desmirais, and to a large extent themselves. My mother and I are a percentage of ourselves. These and everyone and everything else are what they seemed at various times to me. This witty and occasionally evasive little prologue calls to mind the Farewell Symphony, where such characters as Eddie, Butler, and Brees are not Eddie, Butler, and Brees, and to a large extent themselves. Yet where Michel Foucault is himself, and is, as is, perhaps not surprisingly, Larry Kramer. Once again, we are in that gray area of the biographical novel, that border territory into which most writers stray often, yet pretend zealously never to have tread. Yet what better way to describe that territory than as the one in which these and everything and everyone and everything else are what they seemed at various times to me? And why can't that everything else include sex? Is sex somehow too sacred or too unholy to write about with the same directness that we lavish on other aspects of human experience? To what extent is the writer who uses his own sexual history as the basis for his work an exhibitionist? Finally, in writing about sex, are we obliged, as Larry Kramer seems to believe, to take an ethical or moral position? Tonight, Edmund White will read to us a brief section from the Farewell Symphony, after which I shall lead a discussion with him about these questions, as well as any others that come up. And at the end, I would be very grateful if those of you in the audience who have questions for Edmund White would ask them. So I will now present Edmund, and thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, that was a marvelous introduction, and I'm thrilled to be here. Um, what I wanted to read is, is to take you right to the very heart of the Petri dish that David was describing, and to read you a sex scene from this notorious book of mine. When I return, this is 1972, and the narrator is in love with his roommate, but the roommate is not in love with him. And he's moved in with him under false circumstances, telling him that, oh, we'll just be friends, we'll just be roommates. But in fact, he's always trying to seize every opportunity to seduce the poor roommate. Now he goes to a great extreme uh, to do so. When I returned to New York, I went to the Candle, a local leather bar on Amsterdam Avenue. I couldn't afford leather chaps and a matching motorcycle jacket, nor would, ha nor would I have wanted to make such a commitment to a scene that back then was neither as acceptable nor as potentially ludicrous as it was to become. It was still frightening. A raunchy, smiling guy close to 40 in worn black leathers with a worn, leathery face and quick, intelligent eyes came up to me and put his gloved hand down the back of my jeans. He cupped my bare ass in his hand. Hey, you're nice. <laughs> Thanks, I said, you too. <laughs> Live near here? <laughs> yeah, I, I liked his speed, his self-assurance, so rare in gay pickups, which usually advanced with the slowness of an auction between misers. <laughs> Want to come home with me? Yeah, he said, and with 10 other guys. Let's get an orgy off the ground. <laughs> Great, I said. Because I felt confident that this guy, Herb, was sexy, I had no hesitation in going up to someone handsome and saying, see that guy over there, the guy with short black hair and a mustache and a silver eagle on his sleeve? Yeah. 
Well, him and me is trying to get a little group action off the ground. My place is about 10 blocks away. Want us to deal you in? Yeah, I guess, sure. <laughs> Why not? Don't leave without us, you hear? It's going to be hot. We got grass, wine, poppers, downers. When five guys and I walked into our apartment, it was after 2 a.m., but Kevin was still up painting. He was stoned, and he'd placed clip-on work lights all around the living room. He was listening to Phoebe Snow, whose bluegrassy voice with its coppery inflections and guitar string glissandi negotiated treacherous jazz tunes with coolness and lightness. We listened to her day after day, night and day, because we only owned half a dozen records. I brought my boys in to meet Kevin. I asked him if we could use his room, since he had a large foam cube for a bed. He said, sure. I was afraid he would be angry at this invasion, but he wore a crooked smile and looked at my squirming catch with desire. Suddenly, I was proud of my knack for rounding them up, a social magnetism I could exert at those rare moments when I wasn't feeling unsure of myself, an excitement that worked a charm in gay bars where everyone was paralyzed with fear. The best way to cruise, for me at least, was to come to a bar with two noisy friends, laugh and talk with them in the center of the room, then, at the crucial moment, disengage myself from them and tackle someone who'd been watching our group with a faint smile that echoed our laughter. I didn't have the sort of brooding looks that silence and mystery could enhance. I looked my best when I was the liveliest. Now I pass joints, quaaludes, and wine around rather nervously to my five guys, worried that in the bright lights of Kevin's studio their erections would melt and they'd remember they had to get up in the morning for work. Kevin was explaining to one guy how he wrote backwards for hours and hours and at a certain moment of inspiration continued producing his reverse calligraphy with colored inks on expensive drawing paper. The guy, round-eyed, was standing with his hands clasped at crotch level as though he were a cowboy holding his hat and respectfully listening to the rancher's wife. <laughs> Let's go in the other room, guys, Herb said, for he and I were sending inaudible bat cries back and forth across the room about the necessity to act quickly. Come and join us, Kevin, I said, with an offhandedness that sounded convincing, at least to my, to my ears. I could describe the way Herb undressed the slender blonde whom we mistakenly had thought would be shy. I stood behind the blonde and breathed on his nape, his ears, and down his spine between his shoulder blades while reaching around and tuning in Venus by turning his nipples. Within seconds, he was a lion, holding Herb down with a tawny paw and jabbing his mouth full of a long, straight, but flexible penis. I could say how every man in that room looked to me like a package to be opened with just one soft tug at the big bow. Now that I'm in my fifties, I see most men as social beings who have a pedigree and a past, a nature open or closed, someone fun or boring to talk to, remote from me, or no more than six or seven acquaintances removed. But back then, in that bedroom illuminated by a single candle on the sill, they were just wide cocks or thin, balls light and tender as seedless grapes, or big and vain like walnuts, insensitive and straining in their leathery sack. They were a short-sleeved coat of black hair, as closely woven as a knight's male singlet or just a tuft at the neck, as though the filaments were the exuberant waste siphoned off from the column of breath. A man was the surprising assertiveness triggered in the little guy with the pinched breastbone and lowered sight line as he realized he was being given permission for once to dominate another man, and accordingly he widened his stance and squared his shoulders. Or a man was this thick-thighed mesomorph who, through a trick of the will, became light reversed the metamorphosis from tree trunk to nymph and was lifted in Herb's strong arms, lifted and screwed. The guy threw his head back dramatically and extended the line of his long neck with a flung back arm, an Adam's apple and an elbow becoming the only knobs in such long, smooth, weeping branches. The quaaludes relaxed our muscles, turned us into slow motion divers plunging into one another's bodies. Kevin came in, already naked as a child, and in the melee, 
I was able to lick the instep of his foot and inhale the crushed dandelion smell of the sweat under his arms, to feel the cool heft of his buttocks, at once firm and yielding, and to see the leonine blonde's cock emerge taffy apple shiny from Kevin's mouth. Hadn't I staged this whole orgy just so I could touch him in the anonymous confusion? One man would never join in. He crouched in a corner, naked, chin in hand, despairing as Blake's Job, looking at us with huge eyes. We tried to encourage him to enter our fold, but he disapproved of us, it seemed. That was Larry Kramer. <laughs> when they'd all gone, when they'd all gone and the daylight was developing and printing Kevin's body, he knelt above me, his knees burning into my pinioned biceps, and with infinite peacefulness he watered my mouth and face and chest with his bitter, hot urine. Sex was a shadow we cast wherever we went, which traveled at our speed like the calm shadow of its wings that an airplane inevitably projects onto the fields and forests below that assumes the shape of the changing landscape and yet remains constant. None of our friends would have said we were obsessed. That was a word heterosexuals used or older, envious homosexuals. We thought having sex was a positive good, the more the better. A straight guy I had known when I was an office worker and whom I kept up with said to me, you fags are so fucking lucky, always getting laid. You know what a fucking pain in the ass it is for us? We gotta wine and dine the chicks and dish out all this sweet talk. And they still don't always fucking put out. Whereas you fucking horny bastards just grope each other in the public crapper or at the back of the fucking movie theater without so much as a thank you ma'am. <laughs> Not that I could fuck some hairy guys, hairy asshole for Christ's sake. I like that sweet honeypot pussy. We this stuff's easy to write but hard to read. <clears throat> we believe that women held out in order to force guys into the servitude of marriage, that pussy was so scarce so men would have to work for it, and that religion conspired to make men believe they were doing the right thing when they put on the iron collar and manacles. We thought that if women were as horny, as disinterestedly horny as men, then everyone, straight or gay, would be having sex on every street corner. We were free. We didn't fall for any morality bullshit. Anyway, the Christians had already assigned us to hell just for looking at men, the thought was as bad as the deed, and the offending eye had to be plucked out. Before we plucked it out, we wanted to wink with it. <laughs> if we picked up a case of clap, the cure was just one shot away. Courtship was a con, again part of female culture. If we loved one another, it wasn't something we confused with glandular deprivation. Even love was a suspect word. Guys just sort of fell in with each other, buddies rubbing shoulders. We wanted sexual friends, loving comrades, multiple husbands in a whole polyandry of desire. Exclusivity was a form of death, worse, old hat. If love was suspect, jealousy was foul. We were intent on dismantling all the old marital values, and the worst thing we could be accused of by one of our own was aping the heterosexual model. I went to bed with a straight man, a young hippie writer who thought he should try sex with another man and chose me because he liked my writing. He treated me as he'd obviously been treated, uh, trained to treat women, with little fluttering kisses along my brow, a tender tracing of my nipple, jokes whispered in my ear. We smoked some grass laced with PCP, and when he found himself fucking me brutally and slapping my ass, he was so horrified by his violence and my pleasure that he hurried into his clothes and still half undressed, half erect, ran away, never to be seen again. <laughs> we equated sexual freedom with freedom itself. Hadn't the Stonewall Uprising itself been the defense of a cruising place? The newer generation might speak of gay culture, but those of us 30 or older knew the only right we wanted to protect was the right to suck as many cocks as possible. <laughs> Promiscuity, a word we objected to since it suggested libertinage and that we wanted to replace with the neutral word adventuring. Adventuring was something outsiders might imagine would wear thin soon enough. We didn't agree. The fire 
was in our blood. The more we scratched, the more we itched, except we would never have considered our desire a form of moral eczema. For us, there was nothing more natural than wandering into a park, a parked truck, or a back room, and plundering body after body. There had been no radical break with the past. We'd all heard about the orgies in the Navy during World War II, but at least since I'd first come on the scene in the 1950s, three things had changed. In New York City, the cops weren't closing down our bars anymore or harassing us if we held hands on the street. We now had a slogan that said, gay is good, and we'd stopped seeing shrinks in order to go straight. And there were more and more, millions more, gay men with leather jackets and gym-built bodies and low voices and good jobs. We used to think we were rare birds. Now the statistics said that one out of every four men in Manhattan was homosexual. When we marched down Fifth Avenue, up, it should be up Fifth Avenue, every June, there were hundreds of thousands of gay women and men, many of them freaks, but the bulk of them, the regular kind of people we liked. These were the kinds of guys I had sex with several times every week. If I had sex, say, with an average of three different partners a week from 1962 to 1982 in New York, then that means I fooled around with 3,120 men during my 20 years there. The funny thing is that I always felt deprived. <laughs> As though all the other fellows must be getting laid more often. A gay psychiatrist once told me that that was the single most common complaint he heard from his patients, even the real satyrs. They weren't getting as much tail as the next guy. I was so incapable of fitting my behavior into any general pattern that I would exclaim sincerely aghast, you know Liz has been married five times. If my marriages had been legal, they would have been legion. Nor did all this sex preclude intimacy. For those who never lived through that period, and most of those who did are dead, the phrase anonymous sex might suggest unfeeling sex devoid of emotion. And yet, as I can attest, to hole up in a room at the baths with a body after having opened it up and wrung it dry, to lie head propped on a guy's stomach just where the tan line bisects it, smoke a cigarette and talk to him late into the night and early into the morning about your childhood, his unhappiness in love, your money worries, his plans for the future. Well, nothing is more personal, more emotional. The best thing of all were the random floating thoughts we shared. Just the other day, a black opera singer who is famous now sent me one of his recordings and a note that said, in memory of that night at the baths 25 years ago. Thank you. How's that? Is that good? Is that okay? Okay. Raise it a little bit. Yeah. Um, Edmund, thank you. That was a wonderful, very entertaining reading. Thank you. Oh, I have so many questions. I, I don't know where we begin. I want to look at you, but I have to keep my <laughs> mouth. <laughs> right. Um, well, why don't we start with that uh, tricky question of autobiography and fiction. Uh, the preface to the Sybil Bedford novel that I read, I've always found very provocative in that it suggests uh, a real writer's response to the question. And, and, and I've always been intrigued by her decision to call that book a biographical novel. For you, where does autobiography end and fiction begin, or vice versa? And do you consider yourself an autobiographical or, as Sybil Bedford would, a biographical novelist? 
Well, I always think when two genres rub against each other, they produce sparks. So, for instance, uh, in this book, there's a confusion about whether it's autobiography or fiction, as I might point out there is in your news story, uh, in your book, um, Arkansas, the story of the term paper artist, which is a brilliant, I think, example of, of the same kind of confusion. I think this, when genres rub against each other, when there's a real ambiguity, it's always quite interesting. I think uh, what's interesting when you think about Marcel Proust is that he began uh, his long 5,000-page book as an essay. Uh, he was originally going to write a platonic dialogue between his mother and himself about the French critic Sainte-Beuve. And that's the way the whole novel really began. The, the, the earliest texts we have of A la recherche du temps perdu are, are based on this, are, are, were generated by this uh, essay uh, in dramatic form. And then later, of course, when he began to write uh, uh, his novel, he disguised many of the characters, but some he didn't. Like the Princess Mathilde, who was Napoleon's niece, he used her real name because he wanted to evoke a historic salon, and other times he would uh, name, he would obviously have a character like the Baron Charlus, who is based upon Montesquieu, but then he would have another character named Montesquieu just to throw everybody off the track. But in any, in any event, I, d I don't try anything so complicated or ambitious. In my case, it's really that when I pick up a memoir and the author claims that this is his actual memory, and then there are 20 pages of dialogue that's supposed to have happened 30 years ago, I think, gee, did he have a tape recorder there, you know? Uh, or, 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 and sometimes the physical descriptions of people are so precise that uh, you know that it must be reinvented. So in a way it seems franker to me to, um, to just call it a novel, and then you can simplify and reinvent. Those are the two crucial differences, I think. Because, for instance, in the period that this book covers, I was, among other things, the director of the New York Institute for the Humanities, which is an organization that had as its members uh, Susan Sontag, Joseph Brodsky, uh, Derek Walcott, and lots of other very distinguished people. And that would make a whole very interesting book, but it wasn't the book I wanted to write. So I left all that out. And I think, uh, similarly, I lived in San Francisco for a while in the period covered here, but to put that in, it would have been sort of messy. And uh, I think I, I basically was simplifying and also reinventing, reinventing in the sense that I was trying to use even more recent experiences to lend color and distinctness and detail to what were rather faded memories. It seems to me, that what's interesting is that when I wrote the first of these volumes, A Boy's Own Story, in 1982, no one asked me this question. But now I think what's happened is that in just recent years, the personal memoir has become so popular, especially in the English-speaking world, that now everybody wants you to say it is your story. Also, we have so many talk shows in America of the Oprah Winfrey sort, where everybody confesses everything, that that this kind of ambiguity about is it real, is it not real, is no longer a game that most Americans want to play. They want you to say, I was there, I suffered, this is my story, and I want to change. <laughs> Preferably if the story involves incest yeah. of some variety. Well, you anticipated my next question, but I'll go on to another question that's related. Um, uh, Janet Malcolm, in her book about Sylvia Plath, uh, wrote, I think, made a very interesting distinction. Uh, she said that most people assume that for a writer, the great problem is finding something to write about. And she said, in her experience, and particularly in, in looking into the history of Sylvia Plath, she felt that the great problem was was not a lack of material, but an overabundance of material, as if the, the human psyche was sort of an attic, and you had to go through the attic deciding what to use and what not to use. For you, in writing a novel that is in any form biographical or autobiographical, how do you decide what you think is, is, is right for a, for a readership as opposed to something which might only be interesting to you and to your immediate friends. How do you make that, that decision? How do you make those decisions as you write? 
Well, I think that uh, it's a very good question, and I'm not sure I know how do I do it except through instinct. If I do it well, I'm not even sure I do it well. One of the things I did in this book was to try to uh, cram into it everything I knew. So I think if there's a fault of the book is it's, is it's too full of extra characters who duplicate each other's role. There's too much going on. And it's partly because when I began the book, it was in the end of 1992, I had already been seropositive that I knew of since 1985. I was nursing a French lover who eventually died three, uh, two years later. And so I, f I think when you're taking care of somebody who's already very ill, you think that inevitably you will die next. And there weren't any of the new treatments that there are now. So I think I really thought of it as my last book. And so I wanted to put into it everything I knew that I felt, all the people I remembered. And I think I was oftentimes influenced by thinking about André Gide's last book, which is called So Be It in English, or Ainsi Soit-il in French. And he wrote it when he was a very old man, and he said that the one thing he really remembered of all of his life, and that he hoped would be his very last thought, was when he was traveling in North Africa when he was young, in his 20s, a uh, local ruler gave him a, a group of his men to accompany him to the frontier of the next little state. And uh, among them were two beautiful boys who were twins, who were adolescents, and who seemed to have no purpose. And Gide was completely stunned by their beauty and full of longing for them, but he didn't dare make an approach to them. And the boys every day would get more and more unhappy, and because they didn't know, well, anyway, so finally Gide said to a man, gulping, he said, do you think those two boys might come into my tent tonight and wield the fan, you know? <laughs> because that was the euphemism, wield the punka. So um, the, the man immediately lit up and said, yes, and the boys lit up and said, yes, and they made these big cauldrons of, of hot water and put the boys in there and washed them and did their hair and put perfume on them and sent them into the into the tent, and it was the most memorable moment of Gide's life. And I thought, well, if the great André Gide can remember that as the greatest moment of his life, then that gives a new credibility to sex. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, on the subject of sex, you just read, I think, a very brilliant passage about sexual experience, and also a very funny one. Uh, the section that you read had, it seemed to me, a lot of humor. Um, for you, I mean, I mean, speaking as someone who believes that you write wonderfully about sex, and will leave Larry Kramer out of it for the moment, what, what do you look for? What do you try to do when you, when you recount sexual experience? What, what for you is the literary purpose of sex in, 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 in a work of fiction? Well, I think uh, if I could rephrase that slightly, what, to me the r real problem is how to, um, how to free sex from pornography. Because it seems to me that we have two different things. One of them very developed, which is pornography, which is actually a form of sex. It's one-handed reading. People read it in order to have a climax. And if it has too many unusual words that you have to look up, <laughs> or other artistic embellishments, uh, it, it, will, it, will, it will throw you off your rhythm. And <laughs> but I think that, that uh, uh, the kind of writing I do about sex is, is usually humorous and, because it's realistic. I mean, in other words, what I try to do is instead of exciting the reader to have sex, I try to describe realistically what's going on in your mind when you have sex, which is usually comic, I think, because uh, Henri Bergson defined humor as the moment when the body fails the spirit when the body can't do what the spirit is longing to do. And that, all too often, at least, is my experience in sex. <laughs> and uh, so I think that, 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 that I think sex is a way of characterizing other people. It is a way of, of saying something very significant about another person. And I was thinking about that the other day. I was thinking, now, because of AIDS, because I'm older, 
people aren't as available to me as they had been in the 1970s. But in the 1970s, I was really like a little doggy. I'd go up to almost every person and think, you know, I really want to know that person, and I don't know him until I go to bed with him, you know. Well, um, you know, the idea that, uh, that Larry Kramer has epitomized, particularly in that diatribe that he recently published, that somehow literature, particularly gay literature, needs to have almost a moral function, a teaching function, or an ideological function, particularly where sex is concerned, has always seemed to me personally ridiculous. However, it's, since it's an idea that a lot of people seem to believe, I think it's worth bringing up tonight. Um, how do you answer someone who says to you, you because you describe the 1970s with something like a, fo a fondness, you are encouraging the revival of a culture that brought about HIV, which is effectively, I think, what Larry Kramer said. I'm sure if he was here, he would disagree and say he said something else. How, to the extent yeah. that such a charge is answerable, how do you answer it? What do you say? Well, I mean, first of all, I think that, um, you know, I was talking to a, a young woman who, who directs a center for gay and lesbian youth in Detroit. And I told her Larry Kramer felt that I was inciting young people to debauchery through my writing. And she said, believe me, darling, they're not reading your novel. <laughs> <laughs> and I, <laughs> but I think the idea, the idea that uh, that of a 500-page rather literary novel about the 1970s is going to cause teenagers to run out in the streets and have unprotected sex through emulation uh, it is, it is very much this idea of, that the French believed in the 19th century, and I think Flaubert had a trial over that too. It was called incitement to debauchery, incitation à la debaucherie, I think. Or, and, um, and, and it seems like a very peculiar idea to be proposing now at the end of the 20th century. Um, because I don't, I mean, first of all, I think that books... Maybe books in the 19th century were still a very hot medium because it, they weren't competing with other media. But now I think that when in an age of television, movies, pornographic films, magazines, books, there's so many examples of, of a sexual riot that young people can absorb and look at that I think a novel is probably the least likely uh, uh, medium to convey. But I think what's interesting is that no one ever said, Mr. Updike, by writing couples, you have caused young people to go to the devil. You know, I think that, I mean, in other, in other words, a heterosexual writer is almost never held responsible in the way that writers for minority groups have always been held responsible. I'm sure that that Toni Morrison must be criticized within the black community for not always showing the most positive role models to young black people. Or, uh, and, and, and I know that Philip Roth, when he first published Portnoy's Complaint, was very criticized for presenting a bad image of Jews to uh, Gentiles. And I think it, it is only really within my minority groups that writers are held so responsible. And in a way that is not only our curse as gay writers, but also our glory. Because even Updike's most devoted fans probably aren't waiting on the edge of their chair for the next book the way your devoted fans are waiting for your next book because you really are a spokesperson for a whole generation of gay people and they really do see themselves reflected in your writing. And I think that uh, that is a great pleasure too. Even though there's a lot of extra literary political pressure put on us, nevertheless it's sort of like almost being a 19th century Russian writer where you feel that uh, uh, what you say is going to make a difference in in the political situation. Well, to, to play devil's advocate for the sake of a conversation, and again that means saying things, I'd, asking questions that I don't necessarily be believe, um, do you think that, that what, what do you say to the charge that, that as someone who, who does have a great deal of responsibility, who is not only a writer, but who has taken on the role of a sort of spokesperson for gay men, 
and for lesbians to some degree, that, that to write, to be so focused on sex is to somehow create a very bad image of, peop of gay men and lesbians, or alternately, that it, it, is, it is to suggest that, that the experience of gay men is, is one that is, to bar that word that you said only heterosexual in the 70s, obsessed, that gay men are obsessed with sex, and that therefore you create not only a negative impression, but perhaps an inaccurate impression. Well, that's true. I mean, I, I see exactly what you mean. Um, what do I think of that? Um, I, I guess, hmm, uh, uh, I, it's very hard for me to uh, really collect my thoughts on that subject. Tell me what you think about it. Well, <laughs> I think it's ridiculous. No, I think it's ridiculous. I think it's a ludicrous claim, generally, in that it, 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 it turns art into something that serves. Art is expected to serve either an ideological or increasingly, in this age, a therapeutic function which I think is, is, is the most dangerous thing anyone can expect of art or ask art to do. On the other hand, you know, I've read a lot of novels in the last 10 years that seem to me preoccupied with sex and particularly preoccupied with sort of sexual fantasy pornography to their own detriment. Serious literary novels that seem to me to be flawed because of the preoccupation with sex. You are not a writer I would put in that group by any stretch of the imagination nor would I put myself in it, although I'm sure other people would, but I do see it as a problem. Well, I think part of the problem goes back to an even deeper division in the gay community between those who want to assimilate and those who believe that gays have a special destiny or a destiny apart. And I think of the assimilationists, they are the group that uh, feels that we shouldn't make a fuss, that we should be able to get married, that we should be able to adopt children, that uh, we should um, become indistinguishable, more or less, from our, our straight neighbors, and that gay parades, gay politics, anything that's uh, high profile as gay manifestation should die away, that we've won all the battles, that there's no more of a fight, and we've got our basic rights, and we're only holding gay people back uh, by insisting on our colorful folkways. Uh, I think the other group, which I belong to, believes that gays operate as a kind of interesting alternative to uh, heterosexual society, and that uh, uh, although, I, I mean, personally, I think that a straight couple would rather go out for the evening and see drag queens performing and come home and laugh about it than to have two 35-year-old lawyers in good suits and ties move next door with their three-year-old adopted Chinese-American child <laughs> who's then going to play with their child. I mean, I think that actually is more radical. I mean, but, but the neoconservative gay writers in America imagine that that is an attractive alternative to uh, straight people. I find that preposterous. I mean, I think you know, it, it's actually probably the most radical thing you could do, so I should probably be for it. But, uh, but in any event, it seems to me that, uh, that there is this real division between the assimilationist and the special destiny people, and I would never force my, want to, or even want to force my vision on anybody else, but I also, though, do defend the right of gay people to have their own life, and I think what happened was that when AIDS came along, it um, became a, a useful battle cry for people who were assimilationists already. First of all, most upper middle class gay white men in America had ignored gay politics in the 1970s. They didn't want anything to do with it. They were too busy having fun on Far Island. But uh, suddenly because AIDS struck everybody of every social class, these very uh, rich but rather conservative but powerful people suddenly took an interest in gay politics and became very well organized. And I think by and large, that's been a good thing for the gay movement. But the one disadvantage is that these people who have a lot of resonance whenever they speak um, have now seized the movement for themselves 
in most American cities at least, and, uh, and are proposing very conservative values. Well, this, I mean, this brings me to one other question that, that is a very potent one in my mind and in my experience, um, and that is, quite simply, do you feel that in a sense you have two roles or two lives. On the one hand, you're a writer. You're a serious literary writer, which is obvious to anyone who reads your work. On the other hand, you have become something of a gay spokesman, if you want to say it rather comically, a professional homosexual, which is sort of what I feel like I am a lot of the time. Do you find that, that, that it's easy or difficult to go between these two roles when you're being interviewed? Do you find that the writer in you wants to say one thing and the professional homosexual and you want to say something else, or do you find that you've been able to reconcile the two? It it, it is a very strange and ambiguous role to to have, and I know that, for instance, um, I wrote an essay, a speech, actually, that I delivered at Oxford, which was called The Personal is Political, And, and I was basically looking at my own novels and trying to see the political dimension in even these rather arty and indirect books, because I was saying that if there's ever been a group for whom it's true that the personal is political, it's been it is homosexuals. I mean, I think that that um, it, even in my own trilogy uh, of a boy's own story, beautiful room is empty, and um, and the farewell symphony, I try to show that the kind of sexual rapport, and of course, there's nothing more personal than that, the kind of sexual rapport that the protagonist has changes from decade to decade. In the 1950s, he finally manages to go to bed with an older man, and then he betrays him and turns him in, because he's so full of self-hatred that that is almost a natural response for him. In the, and that is the way A Boy's Own Story concludes. In the 1960s, he's in his 20s, he's living in New York, and he's going to a psychiatrist hoping to go straight, and he has various affairs with women that are always unsuccessful, and most of his gay sex is toilet sex. And that book ends with the Stonewall Uprising. Then this book is, is one in which I uh, actually try to show the aftermath of Stonewall, and it would be unrealistic and ahistorical to show somebody who had been sort of um, damaged by the 50s and the 60s immediately able to have a totally successful reciprocal love affair. So in fact, the two major relationships he has in the 1970s are unreciprocated love. In other words, he can say, I love Sean, I love Kevin, but unfortunately he doesn't love me. But I think my own feeling is that if you wake up every morning in a single bed, completely alone, then you're not really gay. I mean, in the sense you don't have a mirror being held up to you saying, you are a committed homosexual. You're still a kind of freelance person. And uh, whereas if you wake up and here's this other man with this beard growing out and, and this hair on his chest, and you say, oh, you know, now I'm, I'm a homosexual. And, and it's very alarming, I mean, because you, your, your, your personality has taken on a kind of a definition. So, um, and then the, the, the frame story for this book is uh, something that takes place in the present tense, where the narrator has lost his French lover, but we are led to believe, though we're not given very many details, that that was a very happy and reciprocal relationship. So finally, he did achieve what he wanted, even though it was destroyed by AIDS. But, um, so I, I don't know, there's an example of what I would say is a kind of political reading of a book. But I think what's very unusual about gay writing, and it's probably also true of feminist writing, what's unusual about our situation, and also a wonderful thing, is that when we write about our most personal feelings, they do have a political resonance, because we are people living in a society, in a gay culture, that has probably evolved more rapidly than any other group that I know of in history. Because I have a catchphrase in this book and I say, gays were oppressed in the 50s, liberated in the 60s, exalted in the 70s, and wiped out in the 80s. And that this is a very fast uh, wash, spin, dry cycle to, to be put on. 
so I mean, I get, I'm sort of rambling, but I think, but my point is, is just that I think that, that it isn't really necessary for the gay writer, if his approach to politics is subtle, to make a distinction between what is literary and what is political. Because in fact, uh, if he simply describes his own existence in a particular historical moment, uh, it will seem representative to people. The narrator of my book, for instance, is living in New York in the 1970s, but he never goes to Studio 54. It's not as though he's a scene maker. He's really a rather odd bird living on the periphery of gay life. But even so, you get a kind of vantage on what gay life must have been like in that period. Well, I think the, the problem with Larry Kramer's position and, and the problem with the position of all non-writers is that people who are serious writers always believe that the most important thing is to tell the truth. People who are not serious writers usually want you to not tell the truth. They want you to tell what they think is the most f efficient or effective to give the right message. To even prepare a position paper, yeah. Mm -hmm. well, let me ask one more question and then let's open this up to everyone else. Um, I just remembered this. Uh, I remember when Caracol was published. I was living, I was actually in Paris that year, though I, we didn't know each other. And I remember uh, reading reviews in which people, and, and hearing people say, it's absolutely shocking. Edmund White has written a novel with no homosexual characters. And the kind of amazement, as if this were a sort of novelty, uh, which when you think about a writer like Forster, who until he wrote Morris, wrote novels in which you can see a lot of hom sort of sublimated homosexual ide uh, themes in which you see characters like Lucy Honeychurch who are sort of proto-gay men nonetheless always wrote about heterosexuals because it was impossible then. What do you think about this idea that somehow as a gay writer, if you write a book with no homosexual characters, you're somehow betraying your own role or betraying the role that the world is assigned to you? I think it's really almost a question of merchandising, you know, that, that you, you have your particular market niche and you're supposed to stay in it, and you're not supposed to wander outside it. I mean, what interested me about Caracol is I had read a lot of French pornography of the 18th century, and it seemed to me that oftentimes in this writing that people were um, uh, expressing a lot of the same metaphors and impulses that I identified with fast lane gay life of the 1970s. In other words, War, love is war, love is conquest, uh, uh, endless conquest, one, and as soon as you make a conquest of somebody, then you drop them uh, and move on to somebody else. This was something that I, I kept finding in 18th century heterosexual French pornography. There was never the least trace of homosexuality in the books I was reading. And, uh, and it struck me as so similar to gay life that I thought it would be interesting to, of a certain kind of gay life, that it, it, it seemed to me interesting to be able to write in sort of uh, new terms about the same dynamics. And some people said to me, oh, but you know nothing about straight life and, and you really didn't do a good job writing about it. Although other heterosexual men told me they found themselves embarrassed and excited reading my book on the train. So, uh, I don't know. But uh, in any event, I, I, I wasn't trying to give an, it's a fantasy novel, and I wasn't trying to give an accurate picture of straight life. I, I, was, uh, I wasn't a kind of archaeology of heter archaeologist of heterosexuality. I was trying to simply uh, show what my fantasies as a gay man were about how heterosexuality works. Well, as a, a, a sort of corollary question, do you, do you think uh, it is possible for a novel to have a gay protagonist and primarily gay characters and not be a quote-unquote gay novel? In other words, if once you introduce gay characters, does that automatically make homosexuality the novel's center? Well, I think what's, what's in a way sad about what's happened to the, the, the literary scene and even the way books are sold now is that everything is classified so quickly. So if you think about uh, the 1940s and 1950s, a book like Gore Vidal's The City and Pillar 
and The Pillar was read by everybody. A book like uh, James Baldwin's Giovanni's Room was read by everybody, straight and gay. So it had a, I mean, it had a kind of evangelical side to it in the sense that, that uh, Jean Genet was read by everybody, and the most famous philosopher of the day, uh, Sartre, wrote a big book about about him while he was still a young, productive writer. And uh, so, I think what's interesting is that these were uh, all writers who 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 wrote primary, well, not Genet, but the other two, Vidal and um, uh, and Baldwin, were writers who wrote primarily fiction that was not concerned with gay life, but they each had a one-off that was a, a gay book and that was basically taken in and ingested by the whole literary establishment. Whereas I think that your books and mine, but not too many other gay books, get widely reviewed in America now. I mean, most of them are categorized very quickly and sent off to the gay bookshelf and to the gay, uh, the Lambda book report. I mean, in other words, they're reviewed by very special places and stocked on very special shelves. And I find that a great pity. Yeah, I do too. I do too. Do you think that's the fault of the publishing industry? I think it's the fault of our whole society. I mean, what's interesting to me is that, is that I, I know a little bit about France, America, and England, and they're all three quite different, England being somewhere in the middle between the two. So that in France, there's only one gay bookshop in the whole country, in Paris, Les Mots à la Bouche. Uh, there is now no gay literary magazine that I know of. Uh, there had been Mask, but that died. Uh, there, and when last summer in Paris, at the Centre Georges Pompidou, there was a big debate at the same time as the Euro Pride uh, March, the Gay March, and Paris played host to the whole European gay community. And uh, some French people suggested at the Centre Georges Pompidou that we might consider in France having gay studies. And that created such an outrage that it was denounced on the front page of Le Monde. So France is a country that, that where there is no Jewish novel, there's no black novel, there's no gay novel, there's no feminist novel, even though there are feminist gays, blacks, who write these novels about those things. But they mustn't be labeled that way. And it's all a question of labeling. And, uh, and because in France, the, the idea of universalism is the dominant idea. And in America, exactly the opposite obtains. Because in America, America wasn't founded as the French Revolution was with the idea of an abstract entity, the citizen, but rather it was designed to protect various religious cults the Puritans, the, you know, I mean, so in other words, it was founded as a way of protecting what were already special interest groups or various nationalities. So it seems to me that America is uh, founded on that idea and that our politics is conducted on the level of lobbies and special interest groups and our bookshops and our literary life reflects that same kind of ghettoization. In England, it's exactly in between, so that your books are mine. If we go into a Waterstones bookshop in London, we'll be on the new literary uh, table as you enter, new literary fiction table, and they'll also be in the gay section. So in other words, there's a kind of double classification that's going on in England. But you still feel that there's basically a kind of dialogue that is going on amongst all people. So that, for instance, in America, a heterosexual critic feels a little bit nervous about reviewing a gay book and they don't quite know what to say. Whereas I, when I brought out my anthology of gay fiction with Fabers, one woman in an English newspaper reviewed it and said, I always wondered what gay men do in bed and now I think I know and it's very boring. <laughs> and I like that. I like that because it was a genuine human response, you know. To, uh, to uh, I mean, she was just saying what she thought, what she would say to her neighbor over the fence. Whereas Americans are so nervous now about treading on the toes of some special interest group that they don't, they no longer are frank and honest. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> I'd I'd like to take some questions from the audience, and uh, I think you can probably tell that Edmund is a very uh, easy person to talk to and a very easy person of whom to ask questions. So please feel free to ask anything you want. I suspect he'll answer almost anything. <laughs> Where are my plants? <laughs> yes? Well, 
What, what? He wants to know what you think of, I'll, I'll repeat that. The question was, what do you think of political correctness in relation to gay politics? Well, I mean, of course, basically, I'm against the idea of political correctness because it seems to me a kind of, of intellectual Stalinism that um, <laughs> where you have to... <laughs> where you have to follow a kind of party line. On the other hand, I mean, I know that when I pick up a novel written in the 1950s, the kinds of remarks that are made about women, just off the cuff, you know, that, they're, that they really are such wonderful little housemakers, but they can't really think, you know, that, that are so appalling that you know that no writer today could write that. I mean, they would have to rethink things. And I've had readers come up to me, just this last week, I was in the United States, and a, a Korean young man came up to me and said, in one of your novels, the protagonist has, hero, has sex with a, with a Korean, and you don't even give him a name. And I thought, that's very good. You know, I've learned something from that. I mean, I, I'll never make that mistake again. But, but I mean, I think you do learn things like that. You become sensitive to these questions because people give you uh, feedback like that. I think that you, I mean, in other words, I'm, I'm saying that when, to the degree that political correctness sensitizes you to the susceptibilities of, of uh, people who are different from yourself, that's very useful for a novelist because there's no reason to make a crude, vulgar mistake. For one thing, it's going to date your books because, I mean, books that, that are very racist, uh, that were written 50 or 100 years ago, are very painful to read now, and most people don't even read them. Uh, I'm, I'm not saying it's a measure of literary excellence whether they're racist or not. I mean, Céline is a writer that I admire very much, and he has the most disgusting politics ima imaginable. So if, there, if it's a great genius, yes, perhaps you can go beyond uh, disgusting politics. But on the other hand, all other things being equal, it seems to me that... That, so I'm giving you a very long, <laughs> complicated answer to your question, but I, but I do think that, 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 that it shouldn't be just given a bad name. But what do you think, David? I'm interested in you. Well, it's a very complicated question, so, uh, oh, well, um, I wasn't, I didn't think I was going to have to answer any questions tonight. Um, like you, I'm basically, uh, well, yeah, that goes without saying, um, but I, I would say I'm basically opposed to the idea of political correctness simply because I feel opposed to any attempt to strangle individual thought or to, to control people's thoughts or to, or to tell people that one way to think is better than another way, uh, at least inst on an institutional level. Um, on the other hand, I'm very reluctant to be allied with the But I think a lot of the problem has to do, there was a very brilliant article about this by Mark Edmondson in Harper's in September, with the fact that, at least in America, private universities increasingly see their job as to sell themselves to students because they rely on students to pay the tuition. And so more and more professors are being called upon to function as entertainers and therefore to teach whatever is trendy. Uh, this is a sort of blame the student uh, argument which which I find quite um, sensible. Re regarding your example about the Korean, you know, I've just been thinking about it because my immediate reaction was there's nothing wrong with not naming him and yet I suppose in the same way that that you might have said, you know, I had sex with a Korean, I was trying to think would I have been offended if you'd said I'd had sex with a Jew? I'm not sure. Maybe it's because I'm so sensitized to it that I don't get offended by anything anymore but it seems to me like everything, it's something you have to deal with on a case-by-case -case basis. And the main problem with political correctness as a movement, if it is a movement, is that it attempts to set down rules for all human and intellectual exchange. And there can't, uh, any time you try to, set a set of, to put down a set of rules for everybody, you end up with something like fascism. And it's interesting that you say that because I think, I, I myself am a great defender of the novel. Everybody's always saying, oh, why don't you write for the movies? And, you know, I have no interest in that uh, because I think that the novel is the, the best literary form. And why? Because it seems to me that our contemporary moral questions and our whole way of looking at morality is always contextual. In other words, just as you say we have to take it as case by case, a novel provides 
us with those cases. And it tells us exactly what the person said, in what sequence they acted, how we're to take this particular thing and uh, this particular action. And we can only judge it from the context, and the novel gives us a context in the way that film is too, really essentially nonverbal, and too quick to be able to set up a complex moral situation. That's why films still rely mostly on lots of action and good guys and bad guys. And, uh, and, and I think in the same way that um, philosophy is too abstract and history is too particular, but fiction is between philosophy and history in that it elevates the specific case to a more general level, but not so general as philosophy. So, in other words, it hovers between those two, and I mean, I'm only saying what Aristotle said. But well, no, I, I agree with you completely. I, I, I think one of the problems is that the whole idea of political correctness suggests that there are right and wrong answers. And for me, the beauty of the novel is that it never offers answers. It simply poses questions. Um, and uh, that is why my position has become more and more uh, that the right of the artist to do whatever he or she wants is the right that mo has to be most strongly protected, particularly in the gay community. Let's take some other questions. Yes? You're right, and it's not inciting people to uh, debauchery. Sexual, uh, nurse. And I would say several rights. I would say that with our very good rights, for example, Bill Nell, you are a kid on me, Dutch, but also Saab, for example, who incite to uh, sexual pleasure. And uh, uh, as you say yourself, you're against this, assim this, this politics of assimilation in the United States. I would say also, uh, it should be interesting in your anti assimilationist. assimilationist uh, way of making politics to include also uh, a kind of sexist pornographic or not. Uh, well, I, I understand. Uh, d d did everybody hear the, the question? No. It's difficult to repeat, but you want to... <laughs> no, because it's very, he's making, I don't mean that as a joke. He's making a very no, it's a, subtle and complex yeah. point. I, I, I mean, well, I think basically the question is, is, is you say that you say, Mr. White, that you're trying to be anti-assimilationist, and yet you're very careful to say that your writing about sex is not pornographic. Wouldn't it be better if you use sex as transgression as part of your whole anti-assimilationist stance? And I think you're absolutely right. <laughs> I, I mean, I think that's an absolutely brilliant point, and I don't know why I didn't think of that before. Uh, I mean, I'm absolutely sincere. I, I, I think it's true, and I never really thought of it that way. I think it's, what's so difficult is to, is that since pornography in our culture has such a taint of uh, commercialism, that it, and it seems to be something that you're doing just to make money, that if you did it in a serious way, uh, in the way that, uh, that, that Saad did it or, or that Bataille did it, uh, it, you would have to, you'd have to uh, frame it in just the right way so that it would seem something quite distinct from uh, the the sort of uh, uh, photo romance that everybody's buying uh, to, to to jerk off to. I mean, another. I'm not. I'm not against uh, sex. I'm not against pornography. It, uh, I think it's very. It serves a great use. But but I think that it. If you're doing a serious literary kind of pornography of this sort that you're suggesting, of the transgressive kind of, uh, of pornography, you would have to find a new way of setting it apart from commercial pornography. No, I think that's a, a good, a very important distinction. I mean, there's a, it's a very big distance between Saad on the one hand and, you know, Coach's jock boy on the other hand. Yeah. Uh, there, there is... But but I think unfortunately the the genre of non-commercial pornography has is uh, is somewhat disappearing. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah. And 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 I think what's interesting is that Saad ha has such a philosophical program as does Bataille. I mean, both of them were. I mean, in Saad's case, he was an atheist and a materialist who was trying to set up a whole new basis for morality uh, by attacking the great basis uh, that had been handed down by Christianity for morality. And I think, you know, uh, 
so the, so the, the constantly he's accompanying these scenes in the 120 days of Sodom with little philosophical disquisitions. I can't imagine that in the usual gay pornography that you buy in the sex shop. Well, not necessarily that I buy, but... <laughs> <laughs> that one buys. It has happened. Um, Is that a question there? Oh, I'm sorry. You go ahead and then, and then you can ask your question. Well, I think uh, one time I was interviewed by an English punk uh, uh, interviewer on television in England, and he said, Mr. White, you are known as an American, as a homosexual, and as a writer. When did you first discover you were an American? Uh, <laughs> and I said, when I moved to Europe. And, uh, and I think that's true, is that... Is that w the, uh, I, I think my most American books, w which are um, uh, The Beautiful Room is Empty and The Farewell Symphony, I wrote while living in Europe. And I think that partly by leaving America, um, I, I was very clear about the, the historical periods I wanted to describe. Since I've lived very little in America and even visited it very little since I moved here, uh, it meant that my original memories were not contaminated by later experiences. I think most people have a tendency to revise their earlier memories in the light of their later experience, but I wasn't even able to do that, so things remain very clear cut in my mind about, about what the 70s was like, for instance, in this book. Um, I think in other ways, though, they're very concrete ways that I think living in France, speaking French and reading French every day, all the time, have influenced me. One thing is that I think French writers are very rapid writers. I mean, it seems to me that French writing, especially uh, philosophical writing, but even uh, and critical writing, but even fiction, has a, a, a lightning speed, of an ability to convey thoughts much quicker than most Americans. Americans tend to be ponderous uh, thinkers and very slow talking and slow writing. And I think that people, many people have noticed that about about this book, that it is my fastest book, in the sense that even though it's already 500 pages long, nevertheless it gets in so much stuff. And I think that is a, a, a knack that I, I picked up, or maybe an appetite or a taste that I picked up while living in France. So that's just a very specific technical answer to, to, uh, to what was probably a much more general question. But I think also it's always very interesting to live um, a, as, a, as an expatriate because you become very clear both about your, your original country and your host country. And you, I mean, it can be very bad. I mean, if you, if you sit around with a bunch of other Americans in Paris and talk about them, the French, you know, I hate that. I hate that. And I, I mean, I hate that kind of, 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 uh, of trying to see the French as though they're this sort of freaky uh, group, you know, of people. And uh, I, I mean, I, I think it's very, very immature to do that. And it seems to me very important to judge people as individuals, not as a group. But it is true that certain national characteristics and themes will come forth uh, that will make you much more uh, aware of, of even the politics of your own country and the rhetoric of your own country. As a writer, it gives you a lot more independence because I think that, for instance, this, I've had the experience of having the same paragraph that will be praised in England will be criticized in America. The same story that's considered a, a success in France will be considered a failure in England. So it, it's very interesting. So finally you just say, oh well to hell with them all. I mean, I'll just write what I want. You know, I mean, it gives you much more independence to have lived cross-culturally, I think. Oh, but I agree with everything you said, and I would add only, I mean, you, I think we've had very similar responses to living in Europe. I would add only, um, only one thing, and that's, again, a real sort of nuts and bolts point. Uh, there is living in a culture where your language is not spoken, as I do, and living daily life in, a, in another language m makes you keenly sensitive to what is unique about your own language. I never realized 
what a wonderful language English was until I started living in Italy. I love Italian as a language, but, but I'm constantly finding myself attracted in a way that I never used to be to these very English words. Uh, the, the British writers have always tended, I think, to move away from words that come from Romance language and toward more Anglo-Saxon words. And I'm thinking, for example, of looking glass versus mirror. You know, mirror, which is a word from, from Latin, as opposed to looking glass, which couldn't be more English. And now when I write, I write with much more of a consciousness okay. of that. And that is, and, and, and I take pleasure in these very English words, words like knack, you know, or, um, and of course, one reason I like coming to Holland is because I, even when I watch Dutch television, I can't understand a words that's been being said, but I do hear words that I recognize, and they're always words like knack. <laughs> <laughs> Last night, Paul DeLeo said, last but not least. And I thought, that's English. <laughs> there was this man over here. Yes, there's a question here. Um, you were in the platform for an hour that you have been speaking to us, which I appreciate immensely. And I think I speak for all of us. There were, although there were still a few moments, I didn't feel very comfortable. Maybe you can explain them to me. And there were the moments you spoke about Larry Kramer. Uh, what is exactly your grudge, your grudge against him? I mean, can I just... <laughs> I would say, well, what is exactly is Larry Kramer's grudge against Ed? The grudge is on Larry's side much more strongly. I think, I hope I made that clear. Yeah, I, let me tell you a little about the history. I mean, Larry Kramer and I are people, uh, we're, we're two people who've known each other since the late 1970s, and we were two of the original uh, six founders of the gay men's health crisis. Um, and then in, in, uh, after that, we, w we were always seemed to be on fairly good terms, and I thought that was rare, I mean, for, because Larry tended to fight with everybody, and I felt that it was a sign of how diplomatic I was that I had been able to stay friends with Larry. And I, and I appreciated his, his friendship. But then, uh, this last January, we were uh, both invited to the uh, conference on AIDS and literature that was held in Key West in Florida. And, um, and I was asked to be the uh, keynote uh, speaker, and I spoke. And then afterwards, the next day, I was on a panel with Larry, and he was sitting right next to me, and he was attacking me for living in Europe and not taking responsibility for the AIDS crisis in America, and that I was deserting this important cause. And while he was saying that, he was patting my knee under the table <laughs> out of sight of the people. So I felt like, what is this communication? You know, that he's, I felt like what he was saying to me is, I'm just doing this for them, but I really like you, you know. So anyway, so I decided not to say too much and uh, not to respond too much and, and to just be quiet. And then, um, then in this book, uh, the, uh, the Farewell Symphony, came out in England in May, and it only came out in, in America in September. But I sent the manuscript of it to Larry in America because I was interested in what he would think about it. I didn't hear anything from him, but I heard indirectly that he hated it. So then I phoned him up and I said, I hear you hate my book. What do you hate about it? And he said, well, did you really have all that sex? <laughs> I said, yes, didn't you? And uh, no. And so anyway, he seemed, uh, he seemed very disturbed by that. But then he asked me to change one specific thing. I had said in the book that I was the one who thought up the name The Gay Men's Health Crisis. And he said, I've been telling all the historians that I thought it up. Would you mind changing that? And I said, fine. So I changed that. I didn't remember what really happened anyway. So, but I think I thought I did. But in any event, so I changed that. And then I heard nothing except there was then this attack on me, and it was not. It was in the. It was in the Advocate, and it was basically the last day of the AIDS and Literature Conference in January in Key West. Larry had arranged to be the very last speaker. He was supposed to be one of you know like the third from the last because they were going in alphabetical order. But he asked if he could speak last. So and then. He said he had to go to the 
bathroom in the middle of it. Yeah, and then he told me he went into the bathroom and vomited because he was so nervous about what he was about to do. And then he came out and he attacked everybody like an Old Testament prophet and saying, you know, it's all nothing but fucking and sucking in the bushes and, you know. And it was all this diatribe about, and, which was rather curious considering there were some very distinguished writers in the room, women and men who had never written about fucking and sucking in the bushes. But... <laughs> Uh, but he had this very uh, strong idea. And so then, when my, when he, after he'd read my book, he wrote this article in The Advocate, maybe three or four months before my book was available to American readers, in which he used my book as the focus for this diatribe that he had already prepared and had already delivered long before he read my book. And, uh, and, 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 he, and it was very crude and very vulgar. I mean, he said... Uh, when you read this book, you realize that Ed White's asshole was busier than his toilet, you know. I mean, it was really vulgar and disgusting article. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, for somebody who was denouncing pornography, it was a good example of pornography, uh, of really piggish writing. So I decided, okay, I never really liked him all that much, and now I don't ever have to talk to him again. <laughs> I just want to, um, I'll just add one thing to that. I mean, I was on that panel, where Larry, and I was one of the people who Larry attacked because I had read something from Saturn Street that had to do a little bit with phone sex. And when he was, I'm so tired of all this fucking and sucking in bushes and phone sex. And then afterwards, typical with Larry, he came up and he said, that was a very, very poor choice. That was a very undignified thing to read. Come here. And he hugged me, gave me this big bear hug and said, I love you. So, you know, this is Larry. Um, uh, the thing I think it's worth pointing out is that Larry is a very unique figure in American history. He is, by profession now, I think, a troublemaker. He wants to provoke. And it is very possible to be extremely provoked by him, even infuriated by him, as I was in the case of this article, and yet, in my case, remain friends with him because I feel, I haven't spoken to Larry since the article came up, but the next time I see him, I think what I'll say is, Larry, that was bullshit. You know, you're better than that. And I f am perfectly willing to say that to him, and I'm sure he'll say, oh, well, like that, and come here, and give me a bear hug, and tell me I should write a thousand-page novel, which is what he's always telling me. So, I mean, do you, you ask the question, do you, are you, uh, yeah. Well, if you've, have you met Larry? Well, you're in for an experience, believe me. <laughs> and now, Ed, I have a surprise. Sorry? He's drinking them up. Okay. And now here's our surprise. Over it, we have in a soundproof booth back. Larry. I'm going to make sure I take in every part of the music. There's a question in the back, just there, and then we'll. There's one over there, too. Well, I mean, I think that there are very few Jewish writers after the war who were able to avoid the Holocaust as a subject. And I think in the same way, there are very few, it's almost unthinkable that a gay writer would bring out a book in which there was now, in which there was no reference to AIDS. I mean, there, the, there, there is a black gay book that I like a lot. Um, it's, um, what's his name? Uh, you know what I mean? Um, the, uh, yeah, B-Boy Blues. B-Boy Blues by James Earl Hardy. It's a wonderful book, but the thing that, that's interesting about it is that there's only one paragraph in it about AIDS. I mean, it's, it's very curious, but, but of course he has a different agenda, which is to write about the affair between a middle-class black man and, and a kind of a tough guy, B-Boy black guy. And, and, and it's, it's, it's a wonderfully rich slice of life 
a slice of life that has never been shown before in fiction. So, but other than that, I can almost think of no example of gay writing that doesn't deal with AIDS one way or another. And so I think almost, um, unless they're set in history, but I think then again, they seem to be read against a foreground, even an unspoken foreground of AIDS. So that, for instance, when I wrote The Beautiful Room is Empty in 1988, uh, even though it, it was about the 1960s and ended with the Stonewall Uprising, one of the things, one of the reasons I wrote it was I wanted to warn younger gay readers about the what it was like to have lived in a period before gay liberation because when I wrote that book, especially when I began that book, there was a big backlash against gays because of AIDS and I felt that we were in danger of having a lot of our rights taken away. So I wanted to remind people of that pre-AIDS and pre-liberation period. But I, So I think that even historical novels are written in that context. I, I just want to add, get my two cents worth in here very briefly, but I think it's to, you know, I, I'm a great appreciator of debate, and uh, sometimes I like to foment it. However, I would say from my point of view, the idea of enlisting artists in any cause is extremely wrong-headed because it suggests a complete misunderstanding of art. Uh, art is not propaganda. Art is not something which has a function outside itself, and therefore to try to enlist writers to say you should write about AIDS, you have a duty to write about AIDS, which was something Paul Monette used to say all the time, is to invite bad books because a, a book can only be written well if the impulse to write it comes from inside the artist as opposed to from outside. That has become something that I feel extremely strongly about and, and, and that I try to state as vocally as I can whenever I get the chance, so now I've said it. Uh, was there a question over here? Uh, yes, in the back. Well, I was just wondering what, your, what you think of Andrew Holloran, because Andrew Holloran has also written has also written a trilogy, which is very it seems to me all my rough as well, from the seventies, the eighties, and the nineties, the dancing with dance, dancing with dance, and being a man. And I just if I ask all of you, because Andrew is a he will be a younger generation than you, and his novels. No, he's my uh, he's my age. Uh, mine? Uh, no. Sorry. <laughs> Andrew, Andrew Holleran and I were, I think we're roughly the same age, aren't we? Uh, I, think so. I think so. Because I don't know the writers, so I just presume because he started in the 70s that he was protecting. Uh, right. The so then it's only more relevant then because he chose to, he chose to start in the 70s and progresses from a very literary dance to dance to uh, sort of AIDS. Well, I think you, thank you for asking the question. I think you have to separate out the uh, issues of the writing itself, uh, uh, as I think we would both agree, and and its content. I think that that the content of of Andrew Holland's trilogy, even the use of his name, Andrew Holland, because that's not his real name. I mean, we used to tease him because uh, his real name is Eric Garber, and we used to say to him you know, uh, why don't you use your real name? He said, oh, I don't want my mother to know that I'm uh, gay <laughs> and a writer. And, and, I, and we, said, so we said, what do you tell her? And he said, oh, I tell her I'm a waiter. And I said, <laughs> and, and, and we said, you know, every waiter in New York is telling his mother he's a writer. <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, I think, you know, he, he, he moved back to his little town in Florida to take care of his pa parents. Then his father died. Then his mother was paralyzed from the neck down, and he took care of her for several years. And he really, I mean, he's a very good Catholic boy who devoted his life, really, to his parents. And now that his mother has died, he stays on in this little house, 
And, and I think, it, in a way, the narrowing of his books from this kind of glittery New York life that's uh, reflected in, in his first book to the, um, to the gloominess of, of the beauty of men reflects, in a way, this, uh, what really happened to him as a man. But I think that the writing gets stronger and stronger. I think that, that The Beauty of Men is a beautifully written book, and it's, that makes it all the more anguishing to read, because it brings up every insecurity that gay men have about aging. And I, just this week, I decided gay men have more problem with aging than women do. I mean, gay men have more problem with aging than anybody does. Mm -hmm, I agree. <laughs> Let's... Uh... <laughs> Let's take a question from up upstairs, so that we're being so we're democratic here. Uh, yes. Do you have a problem equating the Holocaust with the uh, the AIDS epidemic, the Holocaust, which was perpetuated by cruel men upon a disadvantaged group, and the AIDS crisis, which is a great mystery, which we're coming to terms, and is that rather overstating uh, the priority? Oh, 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 I agree 100%. No, the, the, no, no, I agree 100%. And, and the, it, was, it was the gentleman over there who, who said, said when there are great events that happen like the Holocaust, he was the one who introduced the idea of the Holocaust. I mean, uh, to return to Larry Kramer one more time, the, one of the things I hate about his book, The Notes from the Holocaust, which is about the AIDS epidemic, is that he does make precisely this confusion. And it's one that I myself have attacked in print. I mean, I, it does seem to me that there's an entire world of difference between a deliberately cruel act that was perpetrated on one race uh, by another uh, as, a, as an official political uh, policy of ethnic cleansing. There's a world of difference between that, uh, which resulted in the death of millions of people, uh, and, and a medical accident. Because I insist that, uh, unlike Larry, who will say things like, it was inevitable that AIDS would come along, given the promiscuity of the 1970s, I don't think it was inevitable at all. There was not a single doctor in the world in the 1970s who would have predicted AIDS. Bec they would have said maybe that if we don't watch out, we'll develop a form of syphilis or gonorrhea that will become resistant to antibiotics. But nobody ever said that, that a slow virus was going to pass over from the animal world to the human. That had never happened before. It was, it was unprecedented. So I would say that AIDS has no moral causes. It has lots of moral consequences, but no moral causes. And that makes it entirely different from the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the question. Um, we can probably take maybe two or three more since we'll go a little bit over. Uh, is that all right? Take a few more questions? Okay. Yes? I think that uh, th that that of course Fassbinder and Pasolini were also working in an earlier period when there were novelists who were gay who were also had a much wider readership. One of the things that interests me about Pasolini, Jean Genet, and the the still living uh, Spanish writer Juan Goiti Solo is that all three of these are writers who were able to take their own gay experience and generalize out from it to uh, identify with other oppressed people. So in the case of Pasolini, he identified with the uh, peasants of Calabria or from his own Friuli and with people from India. In the case of Juan Goiti Solo, he has espoused the cause of the whole Muslim world uh, and has done a, a fascinating series of television shows about uh, the Muslim world, uh, not, just, uh, uh, not just the Arab world, but including Turkey, for Spanish television. And he's always been very, very alert to other oppressed people, whether it was even prison, I mean, just the, the right of prisoners in, 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 in France. And, and, and of course, Jean Genet was the great friend of the Palestinians and of the Black Panthers. So it seems to me that that this heroic age where in which gay men were able to, and gay artists were able to move out from their own experience. Take Genet. He's a typical case of somebody who, 
who wrote, I mean, the four, four of his five novels, which he wrote in the 1940s when he was in his 30s, are, uh, are, are autobiographical and intensely homosexual. Then, all of a sudden, he stops that. He goes into a 10-year depression in which he did no writing. And then, boom, 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 he writes three great plays in which there are no homosexual characters, but in which he takes up the theme of the Algerian Revolution, although he doesn't call it that, but still, that lies behind the, the screens. And he takes up the question of colonialism uh, in that play, but especially in The Blacks, when he, in which he even foresees a lot of, because when he wrote The Blacks, everybody forgets this, most of the black colonies in Africa were still colonies. He foresaw a day when they would have gotten rid of their, their former rulers and would still be dealing with the problem of being ex-colonials. Anyway, uh, he, and, and then of course uh, in The Balcony, he took up the whole problem of totalitarianism in a kind of Franco-like Spain. He originally wanted to set the play in Spain. He originally wanted to call the play Spain. But, but my point is, and then at the end of his life, he took up the cause of the Panthers and the Palestinians. So this was a man who was able to start with his homosexual oppression and explore that thoroughly and then move out to these larger social causes. I don't see anybody doing that now. Why is a good question. Why do you think? <laughs> is it because we no longer? Is it because in the age of political correctness, uh, a white heterosexual, a, a white homosexual man from America would feel that he had no right to speak for uh, an Arab uh, uh, worker in Algeria? I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, it, I, I'm always full of trepidation when I enter into political questions that don't directly concern me because I feel, I mean, even Genet in 1970, when he took up the, the, the cause of the Panthers, was very concerned to point out to everybody that he had been invited by the Panthers to come to America, that he did not, imp he did not want to be like Sartre. He was exactly the opposite of a typical French intellectual of the period. Sartre would go to some place for two days, then write his statement about it, and then go on to some other <laughs> trouble site. And, and he would, you know, not talk to very many people. He would be received by the ambassador and so on. One of the advantages of Genet being a homosexual is that he was not received by the ambassador. He was, <laughs> he made love to the soldiers, you know. <laughs> and so he learned a lot. He learned a lot and he spent a lot of time. He spent, you know, years amongst the Palestinians before he finally wrote something. So I think he, to my mind, he was the great kind of, of intellectual sympathizer because he was not imposing his vision on somebody else. He wasn't making a spot decision. He wasn't there the way somebody like um, Bernard-Henri Lévy is in Sarajevo for two days, you know. Uh, he was really living there in a low-profile way, as, as, uh, absorbing the experience and only writing about it years later. Yeah. Okay, let's take one more question. Uh, M Michael? <laughs> I think really the reason is the self-reflexiveness of the gay movement and gay writing movement, which is, I don't want to say obsessed with it, but I almost want to say uh, self-reflexive and then this niche market that I'm talking about. Why gay writers won't take on other larger things? The, what, what the gentleman is suggesting, the, the, yeah, the question, yes, what? Yeah. He was saying that, he d do we agree with him that maybe the reason gays, gay writers don't take up these larger political questions is because the gay movement has become very self-regarding and, it, and it's only concerned with its, itself and its own internal politics. And I think that is true. I mean, if you think, look at AIDS. I mean, AIDS is a problem that mainly affects the third world and mainly affects very poor people in Africa and, and Southeast Asia. And I think that the, if, I think if we were living in the 1960s instead of the 1990s, I think that, that we would all be going to Africa and helping those people. I think there would be, the, or we would be trying to raise money or, or set up hospitals or do something. I mean, that, that it seemed to me that, that we all make fun of the 1960s, that it was a very idealistic period when people were genuinely interested in other people's causes. And um, it seems to me that 
that the gay community has had a, a very heavy burden placed on it by AIDS, and we've had to fight our own battle first. But now that we begin to see some light at the end of the tunnel, it seems to me that it would be a good thing, but a highly doubtful thing, uh, th that we'll actually do if we could reach out to other people who've been struck by the very same disease. Let's take one more question, since that was an e that was a plant. <laughs> uh, yes. How come that you still are alive? <laughs> well, I've been. Uh, the question is, why am I still alive if I had so much sex? Um, <laughs> I think that. Uh, I mean, I've been positive since 1985 that I know of, but I'm sure I've actually been positive since the late 70s or early 80s because. I was highly uh, active sexually in New York, and most of my friends who lived the same life that I was leading, leading are dead. So I think that I must be either w what they call a slow developer, which, m which means somebody who, uh, who got a very weak strain of the virus, which acted as a kind of anti antidote in a way, or vaccine, if you will. Or the other possibility is that uh, I might have one of those two genes. If you have both, you don't get positive at all. If you have only one, you're a slow developer. So I don't know. I hate it when people say, oh, it's because I am such a noble person or I have a mission to do. Or, you know, <laughs> I think that I hate that kind of answer. And pe I've heard people say that. And, and people try to get me to say that sometimes. But I think that is a way of blaming the other people, blaming the other victims. Like, if only they had been as virtuous or as motivated as I am, they would be alive. I mean, I think that's despicable. I think it's strictly a medical reason that I'm still alive. Yeah. I think there's a small percentage of people like me who are slow developers, and I agree with you that there should be more studies of us and to find out what it is that ha keeps us going. I also just wanted to say, you say in the book that you had sex with 3,000 men up until 1982. Yeah. <laughs> so in fact, the figure is probably somewhat higher, right? Yeah, that's right, much higher. <laughs> well, uh, I think I can speak for everyone here in, in saying thank you, Edmund, for such a, uh, an enlightening and also entertaining evening. Uh, mostly enlightening, but also entertaining. Uh, this was great fun and, and will give me a lot to think about and a lot to write about. Um, I believe now there will be an opportunity for all of you to, to say hello to Edmund in a more uh, private way, intimate way. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.